continuing our exposition of the Lord's Prayer, the second petition, Who Art in Heaven? Our Father, Who Art in Heaven? Number one, heaven is God's house, though the heaven of heavens cannot contain him, 1 Samuel 8, 27. See, heaven is just another word for the place where God manifests himself. Now, God is omnipresent, and he is everywhere, but when he manifests himself in heaven, he manifests himself in grace and glory, not in wrath, for example, the way in which he manifests himself in heaven, not in a mixture of his attributes as he manifests himself in earth, but in heaven is the place where the infinite God, who can't be confined by the heaven of heavens, by space itself, and so on, is manifesting himself in his goodness and his grace and his mercy to perfect creatures. That's the definition of it, and apparently because of that, because God never changes, heaven apparently never changes. We're on earth now, and we know, as we'll see when we come to some eschatological details later in this series, that this earth is going to be destroyed. It's going to be consumed by a fervent heat, as Peter tells us. And what becomes of it, we'll also discuss at that point, but it's not going to remain the way it is. Christ came to this world. He died on the cross in this world. He wrought out redemption in this world for people in this world, and he saved many of them while he was here and many before and after his coming, and they are with him even here. But when we talk about heaven, we talk about where he is now visibly. He is still here invisibly, and we have union with the invisible Christ, with the spiritual Christ, with the divine Christ, but we do not now talk with him, or as John did, lie on his bosom at the Lord's Supper, or talk with him one-to-one, -one, man-to-man, as it were, as they did in the days of his flesh. That is gone because he has gone bodily and humanly, a finite being in his human nature, to heaven. And we pray to him uh, as well as to the Father. In the name of the Father, we pray to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, whose place of prime manifestation in grace is in heaven. And that's the reason, apparently, we never hear of any change of heaven. As I say, earth will change, but heaven seems to remain God's uh, dwelling place in the sense of manifestation of his special grace to the saved and angels and redeemed uh, man. And uh, apparently it's the very perfection of it that makes it... I'm speculating here because it could conceivably be changed, but I don't find anything in the Bible which says it will be changed. And if it's not going to be changed, I'm speculating now, the reason would be there'd be no need for it. You can't improve on heaven. It's a place where God's glory is manifested, and His glory can't be manifested any more wonderfully than to the redeemed creatures who will be there. There can't be any improvement in it. This is obviously an unsettled state that we have in this world. It's a mixture of believers and unbelievers, and the separation has to take place. Now, this world is going to undergo a change. It's obvious not a final and fixed plate. But heaven is unchanged, and we pray our Father who art in heaven, and presumably always will pray to our Father who is in heaven, even when Christians are there themselves. Number two, rather he contains the heavens. The heaven of heavens can't contain him. He contains the heavens. The heaven is a place, the place where infinite deity reveals himself finitely and savingly to his uh, creatures, as we've just explained. Number three, Nothing foul or polluted enters heaven where God, his holy angels, spirits of just men made perfect, and the glorified God-man dwell together in perfect blessedness. As I say, this is the reason the world has to change because of all the sin and misery in it, and also even because of the sin remaining in Christians of which we've spoken so often, but that'll be gone then. The guilt has been removed now, 
and the power of reigning sin has been broken, but sin itself still lives a slow, slowly dying, but in heaven there'll be no pollution whatever, there'll be no actual sin tolerated, and there will no sin ever occur there. For when Christ taught this prayer, he was not yet glorified and in heaven as the glorified God-man. He told us even then, when he was here, to pray to the Father who is in heaven. Now you, of course, pray to Christ himself, and there were many people in this world who did pray to him because he is God. But our my main address is to be the deity who is in heaven and always will be in heaven as the place of the manifestation of his glory and his grace. I'm just simply observing the fact that it's true prayer which we have now, but it is addressed to heaven where we'll be later because that's the place where we will be without any sin or defilement corrupting the prayers which we now offer. So in a certain sense, when we say, Our Father who art in heaven, we are not only addressing the place where God dwells in his glory, but we are also addressing the place where we belong. Heaven is our destination. We're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God, so that in a very real sense, even though we're here and with, corrupted with a great deal of remaining pollution, our heart's in heaven and our spirit is uh, there by way of anticipation. Number five, he was then, when he was on earth, a mediator on earth between heaven and earth, building that ladder on which angels ascend and descend. People are always puzzled by that language, you know, that referring to the dream of Jacob in the Old Testament there, where he saw angels ascending and descending, as to why it wasn't descending and ascending because manifestly angels dwelling places in heaven, and they must descend before they ascend. So why doesn't it say that he saw this ladder on which angels descended and ascended instead of ascended and descended? I don't profess to know, but I can't help guessing about that. You know, Christ tells us that when one sinner is converted, the angels rejoice. One sinner, and all heaven is full of glory. Now, I, building on that, I can't help but think of the angels who are in communion with this world, as we've indicated before. They're the ministering servants of our redemption. Remember, we pointed that out, and it was apparently that news in heaven that the Superior angels will be subordinated to the inferior man's salvation that the greatest of all the angels, Lucifer, was unable to bear and mounted his opposition and was cast down to hell together with all his followers and so on. But that was their appointed function. And they are obviously involved with us. We have guardian angels in some way or another, to be sure. and. I think the reason for this imagery is probably this. The angels are, just as they were close to Jesus and actually ministered to him directly in the days of his ordeal in the flesh and so on, they are here, and though they're not manifested now, and we don't see any of the angels, Gabriel or any other, Michael, we nevertheless know they are around and they are our ministering servants, and they must be involved somehow in our salvation by means of which we become the ones to whom they are charged to care for and to guide. And so I'm speculating that the reason the imagery of ascending and descending rather than descending and ascending is given is because the angels, when they see and hear and are given charge of one of the redeemed of the Lord, they take that message to heaven and set the whole heavenly host rejoicing over one sinner that repents, and then, as it were, they descend again to resume their job of being ministering servants of the children of God. 
But uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I do think it's quite safe to uh, say that uh, the angels are involved in some way in our redemption, and they would certainly make it known to their fellow angels in heaven and before the throne of grace, and would again descend to resume their appointed activity on our behalf. Number six, while on earth the mediator had communion with heaven, where he was soon to be glorified, so do his redeemed who are soon to be glorified. The Christ was living on earth, but his heart was in heaven. He had perfect communion with God even while he was on this fallen earth of ours. And what I have in mind here about this teaching us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, is for us even while we are on earth and polluted and not fit for heaven yet, nevertheless to realize that is our destination and that is our, our citizenship is in heaven and that we're looking for that glorious day and as it were tasting it beforehand and enjoying it even now while we're there. We do have a fragment of it as it were. We have a heavenly life. If we're in Christ Jesus, it's not perfect, but the beginning of it is there. Christ is dwelling in us by His Spirit. And there isn't anything essentially different from that that makes the glory of heaven. The only thing about it is it's perfected in degree there, as it is very, very imperfect here below. But it's a way of our, as it were, living in heaven while we're still on earth, having our hearts in heaven where our treasure is, even while we are dwelling in this very sinful and imperfect uh, earth of ours. I think, in other words, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are first of all to think it's our Father who we are addressing. And we are taught immediately to remember that there are others who belong to the body of Christ and of whom we are a part also when we say our Father and that our fixation is not on this earth where we don't belong. We're pilgrims here. We're sojourners for a while. Heaven is our destination. We can't wait to get there, but we must wait until He calls us. But that's our home. That's where we want to be. And while we can't go up until we are actually summoned by God in His providence, at the same time in spirit or in anticipation, we could go up. So that all the time we pray, and pray we should pray constantly, continuously, pray without ceasing. The Scripture tells us we should pray without ceasing, our Father who art in heaven. It's a way of living in heaven while we're still in earth, because every time we pray, we are, as it were, by way of anticipation, in heaven. And we are praying to the Father who is in heaven, and we're thinking of the saints and the angels who are there with them also. And just as our Lord taught us this prayer, while He was both in heaven and on earth at the same time, in a different and a lesser way, we are on earth and in heaven also, and we are reminded of it by the very prayer who are in heaven. Number seven, so prayer is communion between earth and heaven with both soon to be united ontologically in heaven. That is, we are in heaven now. We have this communion. It's a real thing, the communion of the saints with those who've gone before and so on. It's not a one-to-one -one communion talking with one another as we can talk with them later and as we talk with fellow Christians now, but it is nevertheless a participation in the same Christ, a sharing in the same life. And the only difference between that and what we have now is ontological. We will actually have the full being of a perfectly redeemed saint in heaven. But the essence of the matter we have at the present time so that there is a real communion with the saints who've gone ahead and with the angels as well as with the heavenly Father. Number eight, the saints have communion with heaven while pilgrims en route to that house not built with hands eternal in the heavens, 2 Corinthians 5, 1. Some of you may have known the late Reverend Thomas Graham, who was a pastor of a church in Baltimore, Maryland. He was a very dear friend of mine, and I had the privilege of participating in his uh, funeral. And I remember saying something that meant a good deal to the members of Eighthsquith congregation, of which he had been a very faithful pastor for a number of years. 
I thought I had biblical grounds for asserting that though Tom Graham has left you, God has called him up to heaven, and you are no longer with his services as the beloved pastor he has been for these many years, but I don't think he has left you in the sense of knowing about you. There's every evidence that the saints in heaven are acquainted with this world and would probably have a greater love for and even concern for the church in this world than they had when they were in this world. And that led me to speculate that Pastor Graham in heaven probably prays more fervently for his former congregation on earth than when he was here. And that in one sense of the word, a pastor's leaving is almost a coming in greater blessing than he could possibly be while still burdened with his inefficiencies and sins as he is in this life. I wouldn't want to stake my whole life on the certainty of that statement, but it certainly seems a reasonable conclusion. I know people I have known who are Christians in my mind and about whose presence in heaven I have no doubt whatever at the present time. I, I feel as if uh, I can see them. I feel as if I can talk with them sometimes when I'm by myself so no one thinks I'm a screwball or a nut got loose or something like that. I'll actually talk to some friends of mine as if they were in the room. I know full well they're not in the room. That's the reason I wouldn't let anybody overhear me because they might think there's something wrong with me and so on. But nothing wrong with me. I just am quite sure they're in heaven and they're very dear friends of mine on earth and I imagine them being there in the room and I'll actually talk out loud at times as if a good friend of mine were sitting opposite me across uh, the room. Now I know he's not and I know I can't pray to the saints in heaven. I am not authorized. I'm told to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. That's where my prayers are directed, not to my friends who may be in heaven, to, but to my Father who is in heaven is the way the Christian is told to preach, to pray. But if at the same time we have reason to believe that we are surrounded by these witnesses who have gone before and are now with Christ in glory and are more concerned with the church below than they were when they were in the church below, then of course it doesn't seem to be a stretch of the imagination too great to fancy that you're actually talking with them and to be sure that they are interceding on your behalf. Certainly, if my friends know me and my needs, they would know far better than I do how desperate my needs are and how much I need their intercession. Certainly, him, who, he who lives forever to make intercession, Jesus Christ the Lord, does know them and does present those and the saints in glory are utterly united with Jesus Christ and all that he does. We are not utterly united with him here below. Our union with Christ is a very imperfect thing. Our understanding his desires is far off. Our prayers are utterly inadequate though nevertheless real and availing, but they are united with Christ perfectly they have an understanding of human needs uh, as perfect as their intelligence uh, qualifies them, and certainly they would be joining with the great mediator and intercessor of our souls when he prays on our behalf. As I think, therefore, I was warranted in telling the congregation at Asquith that I believe their former pastor, Tom Graham, is more concerned about them now and praying for them more now than he ever did even as a dedicated and devoted pastor that he was in the days of his flesh. Number nine, the Son of God has perfect communion with heaven with which Christians too have communion, though very imperfectly. 
What I'm stressing by that particular point is that we can't pray our Father who art in heaven without being depressed immediately with the inadequacy of our prayer. In a certain sense, we oppose prayer more than we propose prayer. You know what I mean by that? Just for, remember the things that we have taught and remember once again that this is a course that was taught in a hundred different videotapes that taught as a whole. This is a systematic theology. And things that we encountered in lesson one will be relevant to lesson 100 and vice versa as well. Now here I'm saying in this particular proposition that uh, the Son of God has perfect communion with heaven with which Christians too have communion, though very imperfectly. You see, you can't pray, I can't pray without realizing how much of our prayers are not prayers at all, are non-prayers. We sometimes talk about the heavens being made of brass or our feeling that God is not paying any attention to us, isn't interested in our petitions. Uh, we know that is never true. God desires to have them worship Him who worship Him in, in spirit and in truth, but at the same time we act as if He weren't. Now what's the source of that? The source is our remaining corruption, so that right in the midst of our prayers, moved by the Holy Spirit, through the intercession of the Son, addressed to the Heavenly Father, we remember that there is far more of us cleaving to the dust than there is ascending to heaven. When we were talking about this matter of seeking, you remember that we do before we are actually converted, if we are ever converted. I think I mentioned that even after we are converted, we have constantly to seek. It's perfectly true we have found him, in a sense. But there's another sense in which we haven't found him at all. If my calculations at the greatest of saints is probably 10% sanctified, then he's 90% unsanctified. If he prays, it's 10% prayer, 90% non-prayer. We have to pray for our prayers. We have to ask God to forgive us for our prayers. We ask Him to forgive us for our non-asking. This is what I'm trying to say, that at the same time that you're filled with joy and great privilege by being permitted to address the deity as our Father who art in heaven, the more you're aware of that, the more you're aware of this the more you realize that you can, with all your puny faith, call him your heavenly Father, you realize, what in the world am I doing on my knees talking to God? How can God listen to a prayer that's 90% non-prayer? And I know about myself, I'd say 99% non-prayer. This ought never to be forgotten as a part of our life of prayer, our life of non-prayer. We pray for the quickening power of the heavenly dove, make our prayers ascend to heaven and so on. That's exactly what you should say. As you realize, I meant before with respect to the Trinity, it's the Spirit of God who leads you to your knees or whatever way you take to pray. You don't have to pray only on your knees. There are other ways to pray, but however you pray, if you pray sincerely at all, it's by the Holy Spirit who quickens you and inclines your heart and gives you the spirit of supplication, but you remember how little of it you have. At the same time that you take confidence because you have any, you say, oh, you of little faith, oh, you of little prayer, so that prayer is a humbling thing. In one sense, it's, I have a friend in heaven. You know who? God. Well, how can anybody say anything more arrogant than that? I've got a personal friend. You know who? The Son of God. But we're given that privilege. That isn't presumption. 
When Christ gives you that privilege, if you denied it, that would be presumption. But nevertheless, you can imagine how the world outside feels. What, what's these religious nuts, they actually think they're in God. They're one with God. They can call God Father, and so on. They pity us, and so on. You can see why they would. But if we could show them that we have a divine basis for it, then they realize, of course, we're not out of our mind. They're the ones who are out of their minds and not seeking for it. But what I'm saying is that along with that, holy boldness, as it's called, coming with boldness before the throne of grace, claiming in the name of Jesus Christ, you must hear me. You cannot refuse me. You have purchased me. I am your child. You cannot disown me. You have every right to do that. And because you know full well, God will acknowledge that right, and he never will disown you. At the same time, you have all that kind of privilege which sends the secularists and the humanists up the wall that we could actually entertain seriously such a privilege as that. You are brought very, very low in the process of prayer by just remembering that most of your prayers are non-prayers. Most of your prayers need praying for. Most of your prayers will make you very, very humble indeed. I conclude with number 10. The Lord's Prayer bridges the temporary gap between you and heaven. They say in spite of this vast distance between you and your Creator, between you and your Redeemer, nevertheless, the Lord's Prayer shows that you're in communion forever. You're on terms of intimacy. You know Jesus Christ, as one person said, better than you anybody in Hartford. That is, there is no friend, no matter how close, intimate, no spouse who's one flesh with you, who is nearer and dearer and more intimate to you than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is the glory of prayer, I say, that while it humbles you, at the same time it's that ladder which the angels themselves ascend to heaven and which when you die, you on that same ladder, if you die in Christ, will ascend to be with him perfectly in the heaven where he is now and waiting for you and where I can't help but imagine he will rise up from his heavenly throne to receive the likes of you.